Ladies and gentlemen, let's read GameInsider.com video. We're going to be discussing the recent AMD and Microsoft's Developers Days conference where they delve inside the Xbox One. Now, this is going to be, I consider, part one because some of this is going to be going over familiar ground. Um, but it will serve us well. There is also some very interesting pieces of information here regarding the Xbox One's API, as well as a little bit of information regarding the CPU. What I would also recommend is to check out the article if you want more information, as there are some bits that I'm simply just not going to mention here because, well, there's so much information. The next part that I'll be putting up over the next couple of days, depending on my schedule, I've running, I'm running uh, frame rate tests for a couple of games at the moment. I'm also uh, in the middle of interviewing another developer on something I can't really discuss quite yet because I'm working on exclusives and some other bits and bobs. So it will be done over the next couple of days because I know you guys are asking me to look at some Direct X stuff, but I wanted to discuss the easy stuff first. So we're all on the same page and there is some really interesting bits of information here. Anyway, so... Well, for the, all of that said, the preface is over and done with. We're all uh, eager and ready to go. Let us begin. So, most likely you're familiar with the fact that the Xbox One uses the AMD Jaguar uh, CPU cores. And there's not particularly anything super duper new here. But found out, of course, that there are two clusters of four cores running at 1.75 GHz. They're dual issue. So in other words, this basically means that for each clock cycle, the processor can move two instructions from one stage of the pipeline to another. It supports out-of-order and speculative execution. We'll go more into that in just a moment. And finally, the SSE 4.2 as well as AVX instructions are there. And for cache, locally the CPU has um, two sets of level 2 caches, one for each of the modules. So that's two megabytes um, per cluster. So hopefully, you're fairly familiar with the architecture anyway, and know that it's x86 and all of that good stuff. So what's quite interesting here is the branch prediction which is basically a way for the CPU to guess which way a branch will flow. Um, it's used a lot for like F and L structures. I'll give more examples in the article. Um, it's They said, and I quote, not a crystal ball. Um, so what they actually use are branchless tricks. Um, these actually came about back in the Xbox 360 era. Um, and basically, it's just a way for the data to be forced in the right direction. Now... The thing is, this ties up with what Naughty Dog have said. Um, you might have remembered this when I was going a breakdown analysis, the link in the article, um, if you've missed out on it. But they actually mentioned as well that, ironically enough, the OOO, that's out of order, nature of the CPU um, branch predictors can actually make optimization a bit harder because basically they can't necessarily code and assume that what they put into the compiler is the is the order that's going to be uh, predicted by the CPU. So that can be a little bit tricky and they kind of have to work around that. If by any chance you're unfamiliar with in-order versus out-of-order execution, I've placed a link to my PS3 slash cell post-mortem, which goes into a lot of those details. So... Things such as going wide and parallel, utilizing SSE and so on are what they consider to be a no-brainer and I'm sure regular viewers are going to know this by now anyway the idea here is of course to get each of the uh, CPU cores to be as busy as possible you don't want any stragglers um, much of the GPU information of the Xbox One is also extremely well known as well um, but we're going to cover it briefly anyway uh, the GPU is of course using AMD's GCN architecture 768 SPUs shader processing units in other words running 853 MHz there's two ACES handling two compute queues each and the GPU handles three hardware display planes with each being resolution of frame rate independent we'll get more into that in just a moment and how that interacts with the free OS design um, and also the APIs that are on the Xbox One. So the Xbox One has 32 MIPS of ESRAM, 
and this is a general purpose RAM running 102 gigabytes per second which is sometimes faster in practice you might remember that Microsoft do offer 204 in some instances but it depends completely and utterly with what's going on uh, on the system well, I was a bit surprised to be honest at the 102 figure that was quoted but these figures were from AMD and Microsoft. This was once again in their Microsoft Game Developer Day conference. You can see the images right here. This isn't my figures. This isn't the figures out of, you know, uh, some game developer even. These are Microsoft's own figures. So Microsoft point out there's zero contention for this. So the CPU, just for example, or the sound, the audio, isn't going to access this memory. So the GPU is basically free to utilize this memory how it, and as it wants so basically it's got free reign now potential uses for this are numerous we'll go more into some of them in just a moment but render targets compute tasks textures and so on are definitely some that are on the cards once again there's information regarding the memory um, it is running at 68 gigabytes a second and is described as low latency, but, and I quote, not enough bandwidth to touch all of memories of frame RAM is super fast cache. A bit of an odd um, sentence, but that was verbatim, I assure you. And indeed, Microsoft are planning and providing plans for a four-stage adoption when it comes to ES RAM. So we'll go into this in just a moment, but this is like a wave of games. So in other words, they believe that developers are going to accept each of these stages. Um, obviously, depending on how familiar they are with the architecture. So the first stage would be placing a small number of render targets in the ES RAM. So um, that's a primary example. And... This basically means that a scene is held usually near completion um, in the drawing process, but it, they might need to, say, run a final picture shader, a, a pixel, I'm sorry, shader, uh, for, say, lighting or whatever, shadows or whatever they need to do. Maybe even do, like, a cheap form of anti-aliasing, whatever. And the second is basically given to an alias. So... This basically means that the memory is going to be dumped and then reused. So, in effect, the memory is always available. Well, when, when it's needed anyway. When it's basically when it's used and then it's freed up. So, after that, we've got um, the third and fourth stages. Now, the third stage is what they consider is going to be started to be used by, like, second wave games. So, in other words, games that are available, like, now-ish. Um, third waves generally are going to be using this, and there's a thing such as partial residence. So, this is going to be where not all of the render targets held in the SRAM. So, for example, you might have certain objects or, say, the sky that's held in the slower DDR3 uh, memory. Now, the fourth and final stage of adoption is DMA, or direct memory access. Um, so this is like resources in and out. So, for example, while you're rendering something, something else could be uh, being farmed out from memory. So basically, it's kind of like as one thing's entering, another thing's um, exiting, and so on. Now, a lot of this is going to come down to compute, and it's also that a lot of the memory management is kind of free. And Microsoft actually put a great emphasis on swizzling textures. Uh, that I'll repeat that one more time. Swizzling. That's S W I double Z L I N G. Um, these are actually done, can be done rather, for completely free via copy with the Xbox One's Move engines, and they're basically altering the byte order of colors. Uh, and this is primarily for the purposes of like, transfer speed and so on. It's quite a long-winded explanation. I've got information regarding that in the article if you're like super interested in that type of thing. Um, now, what about the graphics API? Well, the graphics API, DirectX 11 has had a couple of iterations. Like We've had like DX 11.1, for example, and DX 11.2. But it came about like six years ago now. It came about on the desktop in like 2008. 
So it's not a low-level API on, on like the PC, which is one of the reasons the X12's coming about, and of course will be usable on the PC on the Xbox One as well. However, Microsoft have pointed out the vanilla Xbox 11, uh, sorry, uh, vanilla DX11 PC code will run on the Xbox One. I'll say that again, completely and utterly screwed that up. So basically, if you've got a, a PC piece of DX11 code, it will run fine on the Xbox One. Obviously, you're going to have optimization issues, but this is fine for developers who are creating like smaller games, like indie games. I know it always uses an example, but if you were to port, say, Limbo to the console, then great. I use Limbo because it looks aesthetically pleasing, but the requirements for it aren't exactly high. So, that's absolutely great. It means that they could basically just get straight on with it. Um, it's also great for AAA studios because let's assume that they've created a game, I'll just use the old infamous example of Killerfond 3000. Right, you've created Killerfond 3000 on the PC, it runs, it looks great. So obviously they're not going to create the full game and then test it, they're going to create it in stages maybe to see how an area looks, is it fun, does it control well, what do what optimization do we need that type of thing so what they could do is they could basically run this straight away on the xbox one they'll they can say okay it kind of runs great but there are optimizations available there are extensions available and these provide the low level access for the xbox one specific hardware for its gpu so the purpose here is they could be like okay we're going to use we're going to use high level to begin with okay it's running Obviously, we're getting shitty frame rates because nothing's optimized even slightly. Okay, now we can start to go low level and start to, you know, perform the nips and tucks that's required. So, excellent stuff there, in my personal opinion. Uh, there's also DX12 code that is runnable on the Xbox One. Um, for example, hazard tracking, deferred context, there's uh, draw bundles and various other bits and bobs. If you want more information on what some of those are, because I don't want to make this like super duper lengthy if you already know this stuff. Uh, if you don't, however, I've provided a link in the article and you can find out more information on DX12. I will be updating this on a much more in-depth DX12 article in the next few days, but at least you're going to know what that stuff is if you don't want to be Googling around. You feel free to do so. But, you know, I've provided you the link if you so wishes. Um, so, unsurprisingly, the Jaguar CPU is not capable of saturating 68 gigabytes per second of DDR3 memory bandwidth inside the console. That was fairly evident before Microsoft even told us that for, for a couple of reasons. One, the PS4's uh, CPU, the bandwidth link there, from the CPU to the main system memory is like 20 gigabytes a second. So, yeah, that's obvious, considering the two CPUs are pretty interchangeable in terms of performance. Even if one's 5%, 10% faster, it's like, you know, it's not going to make the difference, really. The second reason is that PC CPUs, which are considerably faster, um, they're not using anywhere near that amount of memory bandwidth, for the most part. Unless they've got like an inbuilt GPU, in which case it can start coming close to saturating uh, the memory bandwidth. However, that means that there can be some issues with DRAM contention. For example, you can have the GPU, say, gobbling up all the memory bandwidth that's available, or it could be just dumping loads and loads of data into the memory. So those could definitely be issues. Uh, Microsoft actually used an example here, which I'm sure some of you might be familiar with. It's the old basic programming, that's basic as in B-A-S-I-C. You might be familiar with that if you happen to be playing around with like, old computers. Um, but it was 10, use ESRAM as much as possible. 20, leave DRAM for the CPU and DMA. And 30, go to 10. I know serious note however of course there are some issues there 32 megabytes is not enough but they're basically pointing out that you know the ESRAM is what you want to use as much as possible well now there was one thing that did make my um head kind of spin when they first announced it but it did make more sense as i listened and that was the free os's 
So there are three operating systems running inside the Xbox One. The first is a hypervisor. This is really lightweight. It's basically there just to control and run the other two OSs, which are labeled as ERA and SRA. As far as I'm aware, personally, I didn't know their names. I could be completely wrong. Maybe they were public knowledge. I, I, I personally hadn't heard them. Um, ERA stands for Exclusive Resource Allocation, and this could only have one app running some, uh, at a time, and is a custom-based OS. Its job is basically there just to run Xbox One games, right? So, obviously receives the lion's share of the memory, the GPU and CPU reserves. The second one is SRA, which stands for Shared Resource Allocation. So, this is using a Windows 8 core. So you might realize that for the tiled interface. And its job is to run multiple applications at once. So the reason Microsoft did this, actually, it's a fairly sound reasoning, uh, is basically that they could do whatever the hell they wanted with the shared resource allocation, the Windows 8 core. They could do literally whatever the hell they wanted with it. They could update it. They could change the amount of memory, uh, or should I say how it handles memory. They could write plugins for it. It didn't matter. And the reason behind this is because it had a set, fine amount of memory that was available to it. Developers had the same. They knew what everything was. They could update the OS without worrying about breaking the other two OSs and so on. It just made sure that there was great compatibility there in, say, three years' time. And they didn't have to worry, oh dear, our update has completely and utterly balked like the first wave of games. They just do not run anymore. There's no, there's none of that, con you know, cause of concern. So the ERA, on the other hand, has three states available to it. Uh, the first is full screen. Now this means that it's basically full resources are available, or all of the resources that should be available are. So the CPU, the GPU. All of it's running flat out. Obviously, you've got the small reserves for like the CPU or whatever. So you've got the two cores reserved for the OS functionality. But the six cores are available. Everything's running. Memory, all the bandwidth, as it should be. The second is what's known as constrained. Now, the, the RAM allocation does not shrink whatsoever. But this basically is because you're not in... Uh, having any user input. So what they do is they reduce the CPU and GPU resources slightly so that the game can still run in the background but the Xbox has enough processing power, enough might to do whatever else you're doing. Finally there's Suspend. Now Suspend is meaning that Effectively, the state is halted with the CPU and the GPU. In other words, it's basically using zero allocation. And so, it's still resident in memory, however. And indeed, to emphasize, it's still using the same amount of memory. So, it's not like it's being paged to virtual or whatever. It's still being held in DDR3. And that's about it for this particular video. So, we've had a quick whirlwind. And as I said, there was definitely some stuff that I personally didn't know. Um, I learned a little bit about the API. And I also learned quite a bit about the OS. I know, learned the names and a few other bits and pieces. Once again, this is a huge amount of information. But it's quite helpful. And as I said, I will be covering the other talks over the next few days. Where there's a lot more information on this stuff anyway. So hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.